Hey everybody, welcome back. We are gonna be talking about chapter 10, which is conflict. I know it's not the most exciting topic, but I have found that this is a topic that comes up in most workspaces because conflict is unavoidable. Um, certainly it comes up in a lot of personal relationships and because, you know, again, we're different people. We always have different ideas um, and timing can play a part, but conflict is something that it would be great if we could figure out how to work through and we have different styles. So we're going to talk about what a conflict is and the different strategies we can use to manage conflict. The definition of conflict, um, as you see from your textbook, has to do with um, it's a communication process uh, between people. And in, in this case, we're talking about it between not just yourself, not internal conflict, but at least two people who perceive incompatible goals or interference in a, achieving their objectives. And the reason I'm starting with that definition is because in my mind, what I have found is when there's a conflict, um, and certainly putting emotions aside is helpful. But when there's a conflict, if you can figure out which of those variables is the cause of the conflict, then you know how to solve the conflict. So again, it begins with perception. I have had conflicts with people before where we weren't even on the same page with what the conflict was. So if we didn't stop to say, well, wait a minute, what do you think the issue is exactly? And what do you think it is? It could be that, um, if it's a work situation, it could be that I think you don't care about the project and you could think um, that I don't care about getting it done on time. When really we both care about the same things, we just haven't connected with each other on how to have that happen. So it starts with perception. And then there's usually a perception that we don't want the same goals or objectives. So again, if we kind of circle back to, okay, so we, we, we are seeing things differently. Let's kind of take a step back. And I think this happens maybe with um, people who are divorcing, right? Um, they might have, in fact, fair perceptions of one another. But when they can step back and say, well, wait a minute, our goal is actually to create a, or maintain a healthy environment for the kids, let's say. If they can tap into that shared goal that is, in fact, there, they can then make different choices about how to interact with one another. If they can't tap into that same goal or objective, it is going to be much harder because they will remain kind of in their own mental space. And then we would also want to think about conflict as a process, meaning conflict is not, I have an issue with you if you're not aware of it, because then there's no engagement there. That just means I have a problem. Or like if somebody cuts me off, if I'm driving and, I, you know, if I get upset about it and they didn't even realize they cut me off, that's not really a conflict because at least two people are not involved, right? The person went on about the business, maybe got off the freeway, never thought to, you know, two more seconds about it. So we're thinking of, okay, at least two people who have different perceptions or might have different perceptions and or either perceive somebody's trying to interfere with their actions or goals or they haven't been really clear about them. So again, we can pick that apart and figure out where the conflict is actually coming from in most cases. Once you can figure out, okay, yeah, there is an actual conflict and then you can figure out the source of it. You have these different tools for working through it. Uh, and so we'll go through each of them. The first would be called avoidance. That's a strategy. And that is when you just leave it alone. You in fact, do not manage it. You just act like it didn't happen. I'm going to take a drink really quickly, but then I'll explain the two key terms. I want to be clear and say each of these strategies can work in certain situations, but most of them are not going to work for all situations. So you really have to take all the variables into consideration. Avoidance can work. Let's say if it's a small issue or you're not going to see the person again, or it's not really that important, sometimes we just let it go because we think it's not worth the headache. But in a close relationship and something that might be going on over and over again over time, this is not the best strategy because, it, like as an all the time tool, because we can experience something called cumulative annoyance, which is um, 
where we let things build up. Uh, and so maybe I avoid, maybe you do this thing and I avoid talking about it because I think, oh, it's not worth it. But then you keep doing it. And then maybe you do this other thing and I try to avoid them. And then one day I just sort of blow up because all of these things were added together. That's what the cumulative avoidance means or annoyance means. And then we become very upset about it. So we want to watch out for that. Then there's also something called a pseudo conflict, which is when we think there could be a conflict, but there really isn't. Um, based on, let's say we misinterpreted somebody's um, nonverbal communication like a sigh or posture or tone. And then we think, oh, you have a problem with me. So now I have a problem with you. Uh, that would be something that we would want to be mindful of uh, because it avoiding isn't always the best strategy. So we don't want to act like something is not wrong. If there really is, it would more, it's usually more ideal to talk through it and then use a different strategy. The second uh, strategy or way to deal with conflict, depending on the situation, would be accommodation. Um, and this could be similar to avoidance, but when we accommodate, we completely let go of um, our own needs and interests, and then we just give them over to the other person and we say, you win, okay. That's a little different than avoiding because with avoiding, you just don't even talk about it. But with this one, I'm saying, yep, you're right. Okay, we'll do what you want to do. You're right. I'll take the hit on this thing. And again, in some cases, that could be a benefit. But if you are always giving in as like, if this is your default strategy, uh, the balance in the relationship is going to be, or I should say the power is going to be off balance at some point because there will be an understanding that you are always going to give in. The third, which is kind of the opposite of accommodation is competition. And that is when, if I use this as a strategy all the time, I'm interested in causing confrontation and then winning at all costs for the sake of winning. And as you can imagine, if, you know, same as accommodating, if, if I'm always winning and I'm always right, the other person maybe will start avoiding or accommodating. And again, when we're always doing one of these things, it's less helpful for the relationship. Because partly um, these events can escalate, meaning they can rise in um, the nature and become more and more dramatic or more in, uh, intense, um, certainly harder to deal with and usually unnecessarily. Because there's something, well, not because, but in addition, there's something called kitchen sinking, which sounds like a funny term, but it's meant to represent all of the things, you know, kitchen sink is kind of like, a lot of different stuff can be in there at any given moment and it gets gross, uh, right? If you're not, if you don't keep up after it and if you let things sit there for even a couple days, um, it can be really bad. Kitchen sinking, when you start competing in an argument and each person, let's say, is trying to win at all costs, kitchen sinking means I'm going to step away from our current conflict and I'm going to throw everything else at you. I'm going to decide... Now is the right time to talk about your family and your parenting skills and the fact that you don't have a job. Meanwhile, none of that actually relates to the topic at hand, which is who paid this bill late or whatever. So again, as a strategy competition, as a general strategy, not good. In terms of um, relationship maintenance, I can't see a time when conflict would be really helpful because we're not talking about competition as like, oh, we're both in the same job and we're going to motivate each other and have a friendly competition. This is in the case of conflict and I want to win at all costs. I can't see maybe when this would be helpful. You might be able to think of something, but I, I really can't think of an instance where this would be beneficial. The fourth option that our book talks about is collaboration. And you can see an image here of a birthday cake. Um, I, I'm not sure why we get the birthday cake as an image, but as a general rule, if you were going to pick one strategy to be helpful in most situations, collaboration is it. What happens with collaboration is you both, again, focus on the situation. You don't, um, you're not tapped into the emotion and then reacting based on emotion. You're focusing on the problem. You're focusing on those common goals as we were talking about with like parents who are divorcing. Yes, we have this issue, but we also have these kids to keep in mind. Here are some different alternatives or options. And then let's let's talk about them to see if they make sense for both of us. 
sometimes they will and sometimes they won't. Uh, and so I want to be clear that collaboration should end up with a win-win situation, meaning nobody had to give anything up. In those instances where you still were able to meet in the middle, but each person had to give something up, that's really more of a compromise, which our book doesn't talk a lot about, but it does exist in other models as like the fifth style. Um, so I think the thing to think about, and I actually have an illustration. It's not part of our textbook now, but it's been part of other textbooks. And I think it gives a good visual of the relationship between these topics. If you look at collaborating, it's in the top right quadrant. And if you look at the scale on the left and the right, the left side from the bottom to the top means how much are you um, concerning for yourself? Ow, sorry, I keep, this is itching. <laughs> how, like what concern are you with yourself? How are you valuing yourself in this situation? So if you're valuing yourself as high, that's a good thing. The bottom scale is how well are you going to concern, be concerned for others or interested in working with them toward their goals. So it's high on the cooperating and it's high on the assertive. That's what makes it a great strategy in general, because you're not just putting other people first, you're putting yourself first equally with the other people. It's a lot more work to collaborate, it, but it's worth it because I believe if you can get in the habit of figuring out, again, kind of picking apart the definition of a conflict and thinking, okay, where is the actual percept, you know, perceived difference here? And if it can just be fixed with perception, great, let's move on with our day. But if you can figure out where the issue is, that's assuming there is an issue, and then you can say, well, how can we both win or come to um, some court, some kind of mutual benefit? Everybody walks away happy. And the more times we do that, the more easier it becomes as we need to do that going forward. All right, so we talked about the definition of conflict. We also talked about the different conflict management strategies. As always, I hope this has been helpful. I uh, hope you will read the chapter. As a quick side note, you guys, I think I might've mentioned I do consulting work in addition to teaching. And one of the topics I'm paid to come in and train people and corporations on the most is conflict management. So if you can develop these skill sets, certainly they benefit you in, in the everyday life with your personal relationships, this will be one of those skills that really sets you apart from a lot of other people in the workplace. I look forward to seeing your homework assignments. Bye, everybody.